Welcome back. This is Emily Seal from Motlow College. We'll be starting on page 63 today, speaking about what it is to be a playwright. A playwright. Um, so you may notice first off the weird spelling. Why the W-R-I-G-H-T? And if you put it into Microsoft Word, it's going to actually underline it and tell you that it's spelled incorrectly. But that's just because it's a jargon word. It's a word that is only specific to theater. And um, it's intentional, that spelling, because it means to create something. So a poet creates a poem and a, it lives on the page or in someone's mouth, but a playwright actually actually creates a series of events or actions that are going to be put on stage. So if you look at some of the lines that he gives examples in the script, right? Howl, 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 howl. That's not exactly the line that Shakespeare gets quoted most often, but it's really kind of a genius um, way to structure out these series of climactic moments, right? Because a playwright doesn't just create words on a page he creates or she uh, creates moments right because like we said in the first lecture um, theater is fluid it's not a stagnant thing so a playwright creates a sort of um, blueprint right they're the architect for the action it you know I, I kind of hate the way that Shakespeare is taught in high school nowadays it really bothers me because Shakespeare didn't even sit down and write his plays to be read that just tells you how little he cared right he wrote sides and handed them to the authors and then um, people in the audience sat um, they were hired to scribble down the lines as people people spoke. So it's not, and in fact, we have different folios. We have different people's interpretations, different nights. Uh, there's first folio and second folio. So it just tells you how little uh, Shakespeare was interested in getting this sort of um, blueprint on paper. <laughs> he wasn't interested in necessarily publishing, uh, you know, written copies of his plays for seventh graders to then try to say aloud. Unfortunately he was more interested in a live action, an event, something happening, uh, not a manuscript or a thing. So, um, playwrights, uh, more than any other literary genre, uh, for drama, they are creating a thing, most often, a living thing. Uh, and because of that, action is the heart of a good play, right? It's action is where it's at and that's um, on page 66 here event writing the core of every play is action what, what series of events just like Aristotle said you know how are we going to create a dialogue that then keeps that action moving how are we going to um, visualize that put that in front of people's eyes so that they can watch that action that plot unfold so today I'll be talking about something dear to my heart. It's a play that I did in um, fall of 2014, is that right? 13, fall of 2013. And that was Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. You can see Alice in the blue dress there. So I'll just be using this play as a sort of case study today as we analyze what makes a good play. Obviously, I think it's a good play because I chose it to direct as the director. You can see me there in the blue skirt. Um, so I'll sort of defend it, and uh, we'll, we'll walk through these different ideas of a good play. But let me introduce it first of all. Um, many of you are familiar with this story. Uh, maybe you read the original Lewis Carroll novel and uh, written for children, and they're very famous Tenniel drawings that are like sketches uh, that are just absolutely beautiful and uh, I remember looking at those when I was a child they definitely influenced my staging you know I wanted to recreate for example I couldn't just have the cat on the ground I had to have the cat up high uh, she wasn't necessarily in a tree but having her up high and having her looking down sideways at um, Alice because that was one of my favorite uh, illustrations so the Tenniel book obviously influenced me. The Disney um, musical. Now, I couldn't use the music from the Disney movie because um, 
that is copyrighted. So, you know, we as professors are always talking to you about plagiarism and how you shouldn't copy somebody else's work word for word. Um, those rules apply to me as a theater director as well. I can't use the music from um, the Disney play without paying for the rights for that, which are very expensive. We actually paid a uh, adapter um, to create this, well not to create, but for the rights to his play, his version of this. Um, I'm just looking for his name. I want to give him credit. Tim Kelly. He was our adapter. And so, um, like I said, we didn't actually have to pay Disney because we didn't use the music. There's kind of a fine line for you as a director, you know, in what cases are you borrowing? You can see I've got her in the blue dress. Um, in what cases are you outright stealing? So I tried not to outright steal. <laughs> so there was a Broadway version, a 1983 um, recorded video. It's called a, a Broadway and Video or Theater and Video that I watched through the database and I uh, took some of my staging from that and some of the ideas. He really drawed heavenly, the director for that, on the Tenniel drawings as well. And then perhaps the biggest one on me was the new Tim Burton movie, which I really like. You can see my white queen has on a white dress and black lipstick and, um, you know, I've got the wig that's actually used for Halloween when people want to dress up like the Queen of Hearts from the Tim Burton movie. So lots of influence there on the costuming. As I sort of worked with my actors, they uh, a lot of them favored the Tim Burton state uh, costumes. So kind of working with that. Tim Burton also covers not just um, Allison's Adventures in Wonderland, but also through the Looking Glass. So characters you may be less familiar with, like the White Knight and the White Queen, um, they appear in the Tim Burton movie and in the Broadway version. So, um, so let's kind of look at Alice in Wonderland. My favorite thing about it is it's so imaginative. I don't know if you remember um, that flowers can talk in Wonderland, and I always loved that um, as a little girl. I loved that all in a golden afternoon, I think was the song, where the flowers were singing. Um, just so imaginative. The thing we'll come back to over and over and as we analyze it is it doesn't really have much of a plot, right? Alice is sort of just wandering around Wonderland and um, it's not very plot driven. So the adapter for our production, Tim Kelly, tried to kind of put a plot on it. You know, he put um, Alice as a chess piece and she's trying to get from one end of the board to the other end of the board and the white queen lays it out you know you've got 10 squares to go through before you can be queened just like you would in checkers or in chess and so um, that gave it a little bit more focus um, but it still has that kind of meandering wandering kind of sensibility to it memorable characters. You should have seen the um, college students, the actors fighting to play Mad Hatter. You know, there's just all of these wonderful um, characters that are so memorable. Um, it kind of has what we in the theater business call a deus ex machina, which means god of the machine. In the ancient Grecian times, uh, bad plays um, were criticized because they would take this um, machine that would sort of lift up an actor playing the god and kind of plop them down on the stage and what had become a very complex story then with the wave of a magic god wand gets magically resolved <laughs> and it's a it's sort of a um, criticism for Alice because she wakes up she doesn't have to kill the queen she doesn't have to um, earn anybody's respect she just wakes up which was a common device at that time you may remember um, that um, the Wizard of Oz Dorothy also wakes up which is kind of a eh, ending <laughs> I kind of had to work extra hard in the staging to make it climactic or in any way satisfying so uh, this is our author. Obviously he's not the playwright, but in our case he's the original storyteller. If you look at a lot of the um, plays that are on Broadway right now, many of them are plays based on a famous novel or even a movie. 
uh, Ghost the musical is out there um, even if maybe they've been turned into a movie because Broadway is getting more and more commercial and we'll talk about that when we talk about musical theater but um, for the purposes of uh, you know, script analysis, you always want to take a look at the life of the original author, whether it be the playwright or um, the original author on which the book of the play is written. So, um, you know, if you have a story like Cinderella, it's an old folk tale, but the first person to really uh, put it into writing maybe is the Grimm's brothers. So you might want to see a lot of the written down things that we have. So you may want to say, okay, what do we know about the Grimm's brothers? So, um, and then how did Rogers and Hammerstein then change that? So anyway, all of that to say, let's talk just some fun facts about Lewis Carroll. He, um, was ordained, uh, his real name is Charles Dodgson. He chose to be celibate, but he wasn't actually a preacher. He had a pretty bad stutter, so um, he was a professor at King College. He um, was not actually, like I said, a, a preacher. He chose to be celibate, which was a pretty common choice in the Victorian time. Pretty popular uh trend going on at that time if you know anything about Victorian sexuality so one day he was uh, with a family friend he was rowing a boat down the Thames River with a little girl named Alice in the rowboat with him and he started telling her these stories and she begged him to write them down and that is what became Alice in Wonderland named for Alice uh, now, there's been some allegations by um, literary analysis since and said, okay, this guy's celibate, he's hanging out with young girls, he's taking pictures of children. Um, there have been some accusations that he may have been a pedophile. I don't really see enough justification for that. I remember the Victorians in general were pretty um, child-centric. They believed in the... Um, innocence of youth and so I choose not to really um, uh, s substantiate that accusation. He was an insomniac, he had trouble sleeping so when we look at characters like the Dormouse who falls asleep during the Mad Hatter's Tea Party or the Cheshire Cat who sort of speaks languidly and is always yawning those are probably based on his own personal experience. Also just the dreamlike nature of his work. He was a math instructor, which I think is um, informs the specificity of the play. You know, I believe as many as six impossible things before breakfast. Well, you know, six is a very specific number. Uh, there's also some reverse syllogisms, some logic wordplay. If you're a logician, you could probably um, spot that. And uh, in general, it's it's very mathematical the way that he thinks, even though it's nonsense. It um, sounds very sensical. Does that make sense? It sounds like the people um, saying it understand it. So they see the method to the madness, even though it's madness. So those are just a few things about Lewis Carroll. He loved games. Uh, there are references to chess and to cards in um, in Alice in Wonderland. I, you know, it's probably one of the reasons why I'm drawn to Alice in Wonderland. My family played a lot of games, and so in general, Lewis Carroll is very playful. Uh, it's probably his wit is basically mostly based on um, just how playful he is. This is Queen Victoria. She was queen in England at the time that Lewis Carroll wrote the original manuscript. Uh, nonsense poetry was very um, in fashion. So if you look at a nursery rhyme like, hey diddle diddle, the cat and the fiddle, the cow jumped over the moon, right? There's no logic to it. There's They just are fun words to say. They're just playful in and of themselves. Um, in fact, there's a character in the novel who um, who's always trying to find the moral. It's kind of a joke. So he's definitely not trying to moralize in any way. Uh, one thing for my students who were acting in this play had trouble getting used to is, you know, being the queen and bossing around the cards. There was a definite class structure 
in uh, Victorian England. And Alice would have been high up in that class structure. Uh, Dodson, uh, Lewis Carroll, and Alice Lytle were both wealthy individuals and probably had butlers, were used to having maids around. Uh, you know, clothes like this don't put themselves on. <laughs> they have to have, um, you know, assistance. So. So when I tell people Alice in Wonderland, many uh, people respond with groovy, you know, they kind of joke about the drug reference. And uh, yes, the caterpillar is smoking opium on stage, and we left that in. Um, and, but I do think it's kind of cheap to think that Lewis Carroll... Uh, was doing a lot of opium. Uh, we don't have any evidence of that, and just because he's imaginative doesn't mean that he's a drug abuser. So um, we do know that Samuel Coleridge was an opium addict. Uh, Samuel Coleridge was a um, contemporary of Lewis Carroll, and uh, he wrote um, The Ancient Mariner. You may have heard the quote, water, water everywhere, not a drop to drink. That was um, Coolridge. So there's a good chance that he was kind of poking fun at either Sam McCord specifically or opium dependent people in his life. You know, it's the same thing as like if we're watching Finding Nemo and the uh, surfer dude is like totally, I mean, he's not a turtle holding a joint, but <laughs> we kind of associate um you know, surfer dudes with marijuana, and, and so, I don't know, as is, once again, it's just my interpretation, I'm just telling you my dramaturgy around Alice's adventures in Wonderland. So, uh, we'll talk next class in uh, more detail as we get into how to uh, dissect Joe Turner's Come and Gone, uh, but actors are always looking for their motivation. Remember the acting class we talked about last class, what Stanislavski really thought was the inner life of your character. And Alice is not so cut, cut and dry, but I do think that her motivation is social importance. Um, everyone who she meets, she's very polite to them. She's always trying to kind of figure out the rules until she loses her patience. Um, and so in our script specifically, she wants to be queened. She wants to get to the other side of the board so that she can be a queen, like the white queen or like the red queen. So I do think that um, this is a coming of age story. And um, teenagers in Victorian England are just like teenagers today. They're looking for popularity. They're looking to belong. They want to be part of the social structure. And they don't really know the games. And uh, it's pretty well documented that Lewis Carroll was not a super popular guy. Uh, he was sort of awkward. He had that stutter. Uh, even though he was wealthy and had a certain standing in the community, uh, he, was, he was not well accepted. So... Uh, uh, some of that may have been cathartic for him to write. I do think that the obstacles are that she doesn't know how to be cool uh, in that setting. You know, it's, you probably don't think of, um, you know, being queen as being cool. Sorry if that's not a fair comparison. But she doesn't know how to achieve that crown. You know, um, in Victorian England, she had a very clear way of interacting with each other. But when she goes to, um, for example, the White Queen, she tells her, uh, chin up and don't slur your words. Um, and then she tells her to run in place. And then, of course, Alice immediately does it, which just speaks to her need to be accepted by the Queen, that her need for social importance. Um, and she soaks up whatever advice she can get, but she doesn't know the people and she doesn't know the rules of the game. So why doesn't Alice give up? Why doesn't she just sit down in Wonderland and uh, make friends with the pansies who are singing to her, the flowers? <laughs> um, I think she's too proud. And once again, that's something that I like about Alice. I think she's a flawed character, uh, and I think that's charming. So um, she needs people to get her back to her beloved cat, back to her sister, back to her home. Um, so she wants to succeed in Wonderland. She also wants to get home, and she's too proud not to give up. She's too proud to give up. 
All right, so like I said, we're going to use the case study of Alice in Wonderland. I've given you the background on that. And as we turn over, we're going to look at the qualities of a play. And then I will see if some of them Alice has, some of them she doesn't. So the first one is credibility. I have a picture there of Kathy Rigby flying through the air as Peter Pan. Now you may say that's incredible, but that's not what we mean as, by credibility within this concept. Um, she, credibility is the author's consistency throughout the story. So credibility um, doesn't necessarily mean that it can't involve fantasy right it can be fantastic as long as it is consistent within that world if you're ever um, watching a sitcom and uh, they have the credits at the beginning and they kind of show you little clips as the music plays that introduces you to the sitcom uh, you know that kind of sets up the world and the credibility of the play if you're watching um, uh, you know some a show like bones you might see something gross right there at the beginning just so you know like that's what you can expect of the show if you're watching something like CSI it might have dangerous music um, because they're setting up the world of the play now in sitcom um, when they start to get desperate for better ratings sometimes they'll do what's called jumping the shark and that's named after happy days uh, the fawns in this episode is skiing and he actually jumps over a live jaws like shark on his skis ridiculous implausible and not at all in the world of happy days before that right that's not what happened on a regular Friday night on happy days right it was dancing and teenagers and happy fun so they're resorting to gimmicks and they're coming out of the logic of the show so if something is incredible it's not consistent with the world of the show and sometimes on sitcoms this uh, like I said is called jumping the shark um, so if, if a character acts in a way that's completely different or not inconsistent with their own internal needs and up to that point you can kind of think of credibility as going steady with someone right you just you got to be faithful to them you got to show up you got to be there um, I don't necessarily think that uh, Alice in Wonderland is that credible in its consistency. Uh, you look at a character like the caterpillar, you know, one minute he likes Alice, the next minute he doesn't. Uh, you know, she just kind of wanders around. I don't know if it's that credible. I, I can't really um, argue that it is. The only thing that I can say is that the human characters... Um, the humanity of the characters seems somewhat consistent. The first time we meet the Dormouse, she's falling asleep. We meet her two acts later, she's still falling asleep. Um, so yeah, there is some consistency, but probably not enough to satisfy a critic. Intrigue. So if credibility is the consistency, intrigue is spontaneity right you have to have some suspense you have to have some um, surprises going on and this is kind of a balance for any playwright how much intrigue do you add without jumping the shark uh, so this picture that I've listed here is from a play that's been running for 25 years in the West End in London uh, the West End is kind of like the Broadway in England and uh, the name of the play is Woman in Black they recently turned it into a horror movie with Daniel Radcliffe uh, in the leading role I saw this when I was in London and it was just a beautiful show it was so so scary and um, I jumped several times the lighting uh, lots of shadow work really tricky if you ever get a chance to go to London I highly recommend seeing it and it's a really difficult show for an actor there's only about three people on stage for the majority of the show it's a lot of lines and a meaty part so uh, but it's very suspenseful the entire time this ghost of a woman in black is sort of um, you know showing up and 
they're looking for her and it's it's very very suspenseful um, so you know you want to keep the wonder you want to keep the um, interest of your audience you want to surprise them uh, you know I, I don't know if you've ever watched a movie with someone who's really good at spotting trends or and they can kind of tell you I bet this is about to happen this some, can sometimes come if you've um, stuck with a, a same writer for a long time you kind of know their tricks somebody like M. Night Shyamalan who has a, a way of always uh, writing you're expecting the twist uh, but I do think that um, C.S. Lewis uh, not C.S. Lewis uh, Lewis Carroll is, pr- is pretty intriguing uh, especially with his mad characters you never really know when someone's going to start barking like a dog that was one uh, section uh, in the stage play is you know the flowers just start barking for no reason whatsoever and the kids thought it was hilarious uh, but it's you never know what's going to happen in, in Wonderland because of this um, everybody's mad here so this is my little baby boy his name is Elliot and you wouldn't believe it from looking at this picture but he uh when he wakes up from sleeping, he will tell the news. He's got a good set of lungs on him. <laughs> um, so moving away from uh, credibility and intrigue, we're moving into dialogue. Why do people speak? People speak usually because they want something. So when Elliot wakes up screaming, <laughs> uh, this is the plight of a new parent. Got to figure out what he wants. Is he hungry? Does he need to be changed? Is he lonely? Does he just want to be held? Is he bored? Does he want to go walk around? Um, But I know that if he's crying, there's a good chance that he's not just crying for fun. He wants something. So when you sit down to write your monologue, which is your assignment, spoiler alert, uh, this week on the um, on the chat room in the discussion board I want you to write a monologue and I want you to say why is this person choosing to speak they could be silent why are they choosing to speak another way of saying what's their motivation why do they need to speak Uh, when you do write your monologue think about how smoothly it will roll across the actor's tongue is it speakable Um, I write this a lot when I'm grading papers, awkward, uh, underline under sentences, because they're just not phrased in a way that's natural. And I know for a lot of you it's because you're trying not to plagiarize, you're trying to put it into your own words, um, but it could end up kind of coming off as awkward. So um, I always, when I'm writing a paper, try to go back and read it aloud and see if it sounds natural, uh, if it flows or if it stumbles. Right. And if there isn't a reason why your character specifically is stumbling, then try to make it flow. Try to make it clear. Um, Is it something that realistically comes from that character? So one of the harder parts of the staging of the show was her interaction with a caterpillar where she's reciting because that's kind of a lost art. Um, Some of you maybe had to memorize um, the Declaration of Independence, or uh, well, you probably had to memorize the Pledge of Allegiance. That's not very long. But recitation used to be a skill that was valued and part of any educational system. Maybe you had to memorize Bible verses, right? And that recitation uh, was definitely part of Victorian England and their uh education system so Alice is asked by the caterpillar to recite these poems how doth the little butterfly maybe you remember that part in the movie and uh, she just really had a hard time um, with those poems partially because it was just her alone speaking uh, without much interaction from the caterpillar during those long poems but also because it's just not as engaging right but other than that I think of um, Alice in Wonderland is a very speakable play. There's a lot of word play, and we'll get to that in just a moment. Stageability. So instead of just writing a poem, 
um, you might think about how can we visualize it on stage. So this is the famous balcony scene. Uh, Romeo, oh Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? Right, and so we've got a very visual uh, picture of the chasm between them, which is the floor up to her balcony. And that is a symbol of the distance between them and their relationship. You know, if we're looking at a play like The Glass Menagerie, she's actually looking at little pieces of glass which symbolize how frail she is. Right, so those sort of um, pictures, the stage pictures that you can create, help it to be stageable. When I've worked with um, people in the past in playwriting, a lot of people think in terms of film because that's what they're usually more familiar with and that can be problematic. If you write in a car scene chase, uh, you know, how are we going to act that out with people on a stage? There's a good chance we're not going to be able to bring in real cars and drive them around the audience, so uh, you might want to think about not putting a car chase in a play. Right. Um, there's some technical problems. Y you know, when we get into this in a sophisticated sense, you need to make sure that if you write in a costume change that your actor has time enough to change before they have to be back on stage. Right. If you're going to change locations, you might think about making it, uh, coming up with some sort of device to make that quicker. Uh, once, like I said, that's a more um, sophisticated element of stageability. Alice in Wonderland was not easy to stage, I'm not going to lie. It's an imaginative sense. So I used what's called a unit set, and this is obviously a rehearsal. You can see Zach there is wearing a striped shirt. <laughs> um, uh, but this is what's called a unit set. It stays there, and when they describe the setting, you imagine it. Um, and I thought that would be more appropriate because children can probably imagine something in more detail, in more um, uh, poetic way than we can create with a limited budget. Um, you know, we did some fun kind of uh, gimmicks. We had a, a leg of lamb that flew across the stage. Uh, we had some smoke and um, during the scene with a caterpillar his uh, opium pipe was actually smoking. So we did some fun staging uh, but overall we left a lot to the imagination. So this isn't necessarily in your book, but I wanted to go over it before you write your monologue and before you read Joe Turner. So these parentheticals, so you can see that Timons is disappointed that in parenthesis that just means that's the kind of emotion that the original actor used or that the playwright envisioned. Gentlemen, excuse me one moment toward the other room, that's what's called stage direction. Johnson, right? And then Johnson OS means off stage. Yes, Mr. Braggart. Timon throws hands up in the air, bounds towards the entrance. Get in here with my coffee. Right, now what you're looking at are two different things, but it's not distinguished here. The off stage, toward the other room, throws hands in the air, those are probably written down by the first stage manager the first stage manager who decided after the director directed it for the first time and he wrote down the blocking. So and then maybe disappointed that might actually be from the original author to give you a hint towards author's intent. But let me say this, we live in a deconstructionist age so you don't have to do exactly what's written in the script as far as stage directions. Uh, because like I said it may have been the original staging, it may not have actually been what the director envisioned. So don't feel married to those um, stage directions. And uh, unless you're working with the original author and he can tell you his intent, in which case I would recommend following the author's intent. Richness, richness, depth, subtlety, fineness, quality, wholeness, inevitability. Right, so a sense of full-bodied language, full-bodied language. Um, this is a play called Wit about a woman who is an expert um, 
English professor, but she is dying of cancer. And I want to read this just too beautiful of a cutting not to read. Uh, I'm at the top of page 73, actually. Uh, Vivian is speaking. I don't mean to complain, but I'm becoming very sick. Very, very sick. Ultimately sick, as it were. In everything I have done, I have been steadfast, resolute, some would say to the extreme. Now, as you can see, I am distinguishing myself in illness. I have survived eight treatments of hexamethophosphil and vinplatin at the full dose, ladies and gentlemen. I have broken the record. I have become something of a celebrity. Kalakian and Jason are simply delighted. I think they foresee celebrity status for themselves upon the appearance of the journal article they will no doubt write about me. But I flatter myself. The article will not be about me. It will be about my ovaries. It will be about my peritoneal cavity, which, despite their best intentions, is now crawling with cancer. What we have come to think of as me is, in fact, just a specimen jar, just the ju dust jacket, just the white piece of paper that bears the black little marks. Such poetic language uh, that is being used there by Margaret Edison in her description, uh, noticed all of the syllable playing, very, very sick, ultimately sick, the playing of that k sound, um, the repetition, I have, I have, just, just. I would encourage you, when you write your monologue, to put some poetry in there. Put some poetry in it. Lewis Carroll is not one to ignore the poetry. I can't explain myself, sir, I'm afraid, because I'm not myself, you see. So that myself, that's a double entendre, and he does that quite a bit in his work, um, looks at um, homonyms where things sound the same, but they don't necessarily mean the same thing, and Alice gets confused. Very poetic. So we're going to look at uh, some modern uh, poet, which is a lyricist, Ludacris, in his song Money Maker. The reason I want to look at a modern song is because I want you to realize that Ludacris probably doesn't sit down and think about these poetic terms. He just plays with language. He just has fun with language. Uh, I think some of the best poets of our time um, you know, somebody like Bob Dylan, uh, believe it or not, Kanye West, I think he's a wonderful poet. A lot of his wordplay is very fun and humorous. So let's take a look at this. On the far left there, A1, A2, B1, B2, that's what's uh, showing us the rhyme scheme. So we have rhyming couplets, maker rhymes with paper, right? Mind rhymes with behind. So onomatopoeia means that it sounds like it, right? Shake, shake, shake your money maker, right? It has that uh, sounds like a shaker and we're talking about shaking it, so. A metaphor comparison using like or as. Alliteration is the repetition of a consonant sound. If it's a vowel sound, it's called ass assonance. But if you look at how many M's, right? Mama, months, Midas, right? All of them keep your mind on your money, money on your mind. That's a lot of M sounds. And he is trying to, once again, draw our attention to the word money, which starts with an M. Repetition, right? Uh, not anybody looks good in those jeans. You, you looking good in them jeans, right? Says it twice just for good measure. Insinuation. Uh, Shakespeare would never be taught in junior high if uh, junior high students caught all of the uh, sexual innuendo. Uh, Romeo and Juliet, I think, is probably the most commonly taught in what ninth grade and. Uh, there are references to Rosalind's quivering thigh and all of the dimensions that there adjacent lie. It's pretty, pretty explicit stuff going on in Romeo and Juliet. Um, but when he says, uh, you look good in them jeans, you'd look even better with me in between, he doesn't just come out and say, we ought to have sexual intercourse. He's hinting at it, which is an insinuation. Uh, a lot of beginning playwrights are a bit too overt. They kind of insult their audience with how overt they are, especially in the um, kind of 
a backstory. Remember we talked about that in what is a play, kind of giving you the um, the backstory on the characters or something. It can be a little too overt. It can be condescending. Reference to an outside author, right? Keep my mind on my money, money on my mind. Ludacris is not the first to say that. Even the most ingenious writers borrow. No art happens in a vacuum. And as I showed you, all of those influences on my staging of Alice in Wonderland, almost every author that you have is going to have lots of influences. Why it's so important uh, for you to research if you're doing a play who that author was and, and what things he may have been influenced by in his culture. An elision. When people see this in Shakespeare or in the King James Version, they often, uh, you know, freak out. Uh, Doth thou thinkst, right, in those elisions, but use, right, how we put you and is together, that's called an elision. And he does that for the purposes of rhythm. And there's something to that. When people speak and they're in a hurry, they elide their words, right? Um, you can speak in a way in your monologue that has personality. You don't have to speak in proper formal English, right? What you doing? You're probably going to spell that W-A-T-C-H-A, whatcha, right? Because that's how people speak if you're doing a casual monologue. Maybe the person that you're speaking for is very uppity and maybe they don't elide their words, but that's a decision for you to make as the playwright. So each character should have their own voice. So if we're talking about Romeo and Juliet, this is Ro uh, Juliet and the nurse. And the nurse, you'll notice, is once again, like we talked about in the playwriting, uh, in the play lecture, she is lower class. So she doesn't speak in verse. She doesn't have to speak in iambic pentameter. She is um, often humorous and uh, honestly she doesn't make a lot of sense in many cases. So she has normal speech whereas Juliet often is speaking in iambic pentameter. Right? So each one has their different rhythm, their different voice. So if you were to write dialogue, you want to think about that. What is the education and background of one person? Right? Juliet is expected to be this princess type person. She's of high standing in her community. The nurse is not. She's lower class. She's probably from um, the different side of town. So maybe she speaks with a different, um, she uses different words that are more colloquial for her. She's not as educated. So ask those things about your character before you write that character. Are they smart? Are they um, from a certain part of the country? How do they speak? Oh, uh, this is our Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Uh, they probably have the most distinct voice in the play because they speak in rhyme, right? And they have a lot of words that they heavily lean on, like contrary-wise. And they're also children. So Alice speaks very formally. Alice is very um, proper. Tweedledee and Tweedledum are borderline rude, and they speak in rhyme. So that's kind of fun. And I chose to cast two best friends because uh, they already had this chemistry together and were already finishing each other's sentences. So that was pretty fun. So I have a devil here <laughs> because uh, it's, you know, in some eras of playwriting history, we have written people all black or all white, right? We talked about melodrama and the man's either wearing a black hat or a white hat, right? I would encourage you not to do that because it's really not a modern thing to do. Most modern playwrights are writing complex characters who have flaws that we can identify with, someone that we can understand on a deep level. Um, so I think of the white rabbit. As I said here at the beginning, he's calling Alice stupid. Uh, he's very abrupt, like a lot of people in Wonderland, and he's running away from her. But in our version, um, in the one that was written uh, for the stage, by the end, by the time she's going to the trial, he's decided that they're friends, and he's speaking to her in a way um, 
that is you know will you be my friend and she says yes it's a very heartwarming kind of moment in the script um and so it was kind of an unexpected once again um see uh, lewis carroll is is giving us lots of intrigue lots of surprises um so uh, a good play has some gravitas it has um pertinence which pertinence just means that it's relevant to what's going on uh, some of my musical theater buffs may recognize this picture as the original cast of rent on broadway this play was so important in its time and i almost hated when it got turned into a musical for the film because it didn't have the same um, effect because it, it was about AIDS in a time when people weren't talking about AIDS. It was so new as a style on Broadway. It's been imitated so many times since, um, but at its time, it was something completely different from what we were seeing. Um, and it was talking about uh, not just AIDS, but drug use and um, the kind of what people were going through, uh, homosexuality, it was really shocking in a lot of ways, uh, but it was very, very pertinent to what was going on, um, and it had some gravitas, it had some meaning, it it speak to, speaks importantly. So that's something to think about when you write your monologue. Could you talk about a current issue the way that George Bernard Shaw did? Could you talk about something that weighs heavy on your own heart and you think that other people want to talk about it? This is often, um, you know, playwrights trying to nudge the world. We'll talk about that in just a moment. I do think that of for a children's novel, Alice in Wonderland has a lot of gravity because it's all about growing pains in essence. Alice is being reintroduced to herself, to her world. She's shooting up 10 feet tall. She's back down to 10 inches. She's changing. And that is so hard for children to understand how quickly they're changing and the sort of identity crisis that we go through. I knew who I was this morning, but I've changed a few times since then, right? And and I think that that has a lot of um, timelessness. It's not necessarily pertinence in the way that it's hitting somebody's attention right at the moment that it needs to be spoken about, the way that homosexuality, homosexuality and AIDS was um, when Rent was written. But it does speak to children, I think, and it does speak to them deeply. Here's what I was just giving a reference to. All playwrights, rich or poor, want to nudge the world a little. That's Tom Stoppard, uh, most famous for Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Uh, yeah, a lot of writers, I think even outside of playwriting, you know, we write to either to entertain or to educate. And even the most entertaining of plays is still going to have a little bit of education in there. Uh, on page 75, you can see a picture from Joe Turner's Come and Gone, which is the play that you're asked uh, to read for our upcoming project. Uh, there is no doubt that August Wilson is writing to educate. He really, really wants to change the world. And uh, we'll talk more about that next class. So another test of a good play is compression, right? Can you condense it? Can you say it in as few characters, events, locations, and words? Um, in the French uh, Renaissance, there was this obsession with verisimilitude. And you don't have to know that word, uh, but it just meant one time, one location, right? And the idea and the idea was for it not to get too complicated, right? If you're going to write just one monologue, you don't want to have a flashback in the middle of it, right? Uh, because your audience can get confused. So if you can write something with one location, uh, one plot, uh, one place, uh, or sorry, one amount of time in real time, you know, no flashbacks or anything like that, it can be less confusing for your audience. Um, and once again, that plot-driven intensity, 
right? Can we keep the action rolling along? I have a picture here from the Scottish play Macbeth by Shakespeare, which is the quickest and shortest of Shakespeare's plays. It just happens event after event after an event, and it's just, it's definitely got the intensity of an action movie. Um, and that's Kenneth Branagh there. You may recognize him. He does a lot of Shakespeare. He directed the Thor movies because uh, the Thor character speaks kind of in that Shakespearean voice and that epic classical voice. Uh, he performed Macbeth here inside of a church, interestingly enough. So there's only like 250 seats and all of the people in... Um, Manchester, England, were you know fighting and scrambling to see that version, but yeah, how how can you edit your play to be as compact and quick moving so that Aristotle can approve? Once again, I don't really think that uh, Lewis Carroll was interested in keeping uh, Alice in Wonderland short. The novels are very long, not that plot driven, so if I had to give him a grade, he'd probably be a C in the compression department. <laughs> uh, a lot of them are long winded. So at the uh, last of our What Makes a Good Play is Celebration celebration. So this guy right here is Dionysus. He's the fat guy there in the middle. Dionysus was the Greek god of blurred lines. Robin Thicke song, you can think of it that way. Um, but he was the god of wine. He was the god of fertility. He was the god of um, sex and the harvest and uh, the god of theater. So they would have this festival to uh, Dionysus, the Dionysian festival, and it was in the springtime, and they would drink, and there would be public uh, communion, everybody would come together, and they would pray to Dionysus and watch the theater. Um, so I think the essence of that was celebratory the original intention of theater was to celebrate. And so I think that even the saddest of plays is still going to have an element of celebration in it. <laughs> and I definitely think, this is just a rehearsal of Alice, uh, I definitely think that that playfulness uh, was a celebration of life, no doubt. We laughed so much in those rehearsals and had so much fun together. Um, I definitely think that the children celebrated life with us as we did Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> so how do playwrights go about doing what they do, right? What is their process? Well, as I said, none of this happens in a vacuum. So they look at their favorite works, they look at other authors, and maybe you want to write a piece of fan fiction for your um, monologue that you're writing this week. Well, I would encourage you, as this picture uh, makes fun of, to change the names, right? Please don't write me a a monologue in the voice of Harry Potter because that is plagiarism, right? You can give me a voice of Larry Cotter, right? Just change it a little bit so that it's not plagiarism. Um, Neil Simon famously said that he would just walk down the streets of New York and he would overhear people's conversations and that would be his muse. That would inspire him to write his dialogue. Uh, it would give him an idea for a story. So observation, which is something that's a really true skill when it comes to acting as well. Observing your reality, seeing what interests people, seeing um, what's true in the world. Because remember, Aristotle thought that the most interesting thing for us to observe is the truth, right? Lastly, a good play has conflict. If people come to me and they're like, I just can't think of anything to do for my monologue. I say, what was the last time that you got into a fight and what did you really want to say? Maybe it didn't come out in that moment, um, but when you were really fueled up, what was it that you wish you could have said? Right. So that forced conflict, that drama, 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 <laughs> is at the heart of a good play. If you've got a serious conflict where someone has really tough motivation and also obstacles in their path, but a reason that they have to push through those obstacles, you've probably got a pretty good play on your hands. So 
um, happy writing. I hope you're not too intimidated by it. Uh, have fun with it. There aren't many wrong answers, so just take a stab at writing your play. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed some of the pictures that I had of Alice in Wonderland. Hopefully you knew some, maybe some cast or crew members. Uh, as always, thank you for listening. <laughs>